Think about if you take, uh, say, a beach ball to the beach or to the pool. Well, what happens if you try to push a beach ball underneath the water? Well, you know, if you try to push the beach ball underneath the water, it's hard. It's hard to push the, be push the beach ball underneath the water. It feels like there's a little person underneath pushing back up on you, right? In fact, if the beach ball is big enough, it might be almost impossible to push the whole beach ball underneath the water. You know what I'm talking about? It always feels like there's somebody underneath pushing back up. Well, the name of that little person that's pushing back up is the buoyant force. One of the main themes of the physics course is that we keep learning about one new special type of force after another. We learned about the weight, we learned about the friction force, we learned about the spring force and the normal force. Well, now I, think, I guess this is our last new force, which is the buoyant force. This is the force that the water is exerting. Now, the formula for the buoyant force is density times g times v. Every time we learn a new force, we have to learn a new formula. For example, we know the weight is m times g, or the kinetic friction is mu times the normal force, or the spring force is k times x. So now we have to learn our last new formula for our buoyant force. And as usual, I'm going to put a dot here to show that this is just going to give us the magnitude of the buoyant force. We'll figure out the direction on our own. So we'll use the dot here to show this is just the magnitude of the buoyant force. Because we should be able to use our common sense to see what the direction is of the buoyant force. What, what is the direction of the buoyant force on this object? Uh, up. That's right. What's the direction of weight? Down. down. So some forces are up and some forces are down. So the buoyant force is always an upward force. And of course, we already know that from our common sense. The reason that it's difficult to push a beach ball underneath the water is because it feels like there's a little person trying to push up on the, on the beach ball. It never feels like the little person is trying to pull it down. They're not trying to suck it down, they're trying to push it up. So that's our buoyant force. One of the most common mistakes that people make when they're working with fluids is, usually with fluids, there's two substances. There's the object and there's the fluid. The object and the fluid. For example, here, this is the object. And this is the fluid. We don't want to confuse the, the fluid with the object that's in the fluid. Well, they both have a density. There's the density of the object and there's the density of the fluid. And you have to always keep, keep asking yourself, which density should I plug in, the fluid or the object? Well, who is it that's actually pushing on the object? It's the fluid. So here we should use the density of the fluid, not the density of the object. The denser the liquid is, the bigger the buoyant force. So we should make sure when we write this formula that we don't just write density, we write the density of the fluid. Because otherwise we could easily plug in the density of the object, which would be the wrong density. I think it's kind of intuitive that the denser, a denser fluid would have a greater buoyant force. It's harder to push an object down through a dense fluid than through a non-dense fluid. I think that's kind of intuitive. Uh, we know that g is the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. And then v here is for volume. However, if you think about it, only the portion, only the volume that's submerged contributes to the buoyant force. The buoyant force comes only from the portion of the object that is submerged. For example, in this picture, these brackets would indicate the total volume of the object. Here's the total volume of the object. But here's the portion of the object that is submerged. The board is kind of smudgy here. Can you see what I wrote? Now we're going to have to use both V sub and V object. So it's important to be clear in our mind about what the difference between them is. V sub is the volume of the portion of the object that is submerged underneath the fluid. And V object represents the total volume of the object, both above and below the fluid. And we just learned that the buoyant force does not depend on the total volume of the object. It only depends on the portion of the object that is submerged. So it's important to put this subscript in here for sub.
Could V sub ever equal the volume of the object? What, what, would, what, would, this, what would the picture look like if V sub was equal to V object? How could that happen? The object would sink, so it wouldn't come through. Right, but what would the picture look like? I think you've got the right picture in your mind. That would only happen if the entire object is submerged, right? Now, the total volume of the object is identical to the portion that's submerged, because the whole thing is submerged. So, in this case, these would be the same thing. And now you could just plug in the volume of the object to figure out the buoyant force. You can only plug in the volume of the object to find the buoyant force if the total object is submerged. But if only a portion of the object is submerged, then the buoyant force doesn't depend on the total volume of the object. It only depends on the volume of the portion of the object that is submerged. Does that make any sense? Uh, does the, um, so if the object sinks to the bottom of fluid, there's still a buoyant force acting on it. Just it just means that it's not large enough to counteract the the object. Well, what you said at the end there is exactly right. There is still a buoyant force, mm -hmm. but the buoyant force is not enough to counteract to counteract what? The weight of the, the object. weight of the object. That's right. So what is it that's trying to make the object float? The buoyant force. And what is it that's trying to make the object sink? The weight. So we have a titanic struggle here between the buoyant force and the weight. If the object is floating, that means that ultimately the buoyant force was successful in balancing out the weight. But if the object is sinking, then the buoyant force was unable to counterbalance the weight. So yeah, even if it's totally submerged, there still is a buoyant force. After all, we can see that from the formula here. Suppose the object is completely submerged, well, that, would any of these terms be zero? No, so there would be a buoyant force. In fact, when is the buoyant force the greatest? Is the buoyant force greater in this picture or in this picture? Because here, the volume that's submerged is the total volume of the object. So if these are the same object in both pictures, this would be the case where it's feeling the greater buoyant force. That kind of makes sense. After all, suppose that you had, just to make kind of a jokey example, what's the buoyant force on this object? Suppose you're holding the object out of the water. What's the buoyant force on it? Well, obviously, there's no buoyant force on it until it's in the water. Only the portion of the object that's inside of the water feels a buoyant force. And again, you know this from going to the beach. I was complaining a second ago about, oh, it's so hard to push the beach ball underneath the, underneath the water. But it's, it's very easy to push the first sliver of beach ball under the water. It's very easy to put a corner of the beach ball underneath the water. It just gets harder and harder as you try to push more and more of the beach ball underneath the water. And the reason is that as you push more and more of it under the water, V sub gets bigger and bigger. So the buoyant force gets bigger and bigger. Okay. When you're solving a problem, then, you always need to pay very close attention to whether the object is partially submerged or completely submerged. If it's partially submerged, then the volume submerged is less than the volume of the object. But if it's completely submerged, then the volume submerged is the same as the volume of the object. If the object is floating, then it should be partially submerged and partially unsubmerged, like this. But if the object is sinking, it must be completely submerged. 